country finds itself confronted with but three choices, to keep their heads down, to leave the country, or to fight back. The 15th episode of School of Resistance, created in the context of the Polish Malta Festival 2021 in Poznań, will bring together several people who center their work around queer liberation. Together with the philosopher Helen Hester and author of the book Xenofeminism, the Polish drag performer and political activist Maciej Gasiu Gosniowski will talk about LGBTQI rights and the artistic potential of transforming desire and gender. And my name is Kasia Wojcik, and I'm very happy to introduce you to our guests today. Um, I will briefly um, read the biographies um, of the guests to you, and then we will enter into the conversation. Thank you, first of all, of being here. Very happy about that. Helen Hester is a professor of gender, technology, and cultural politics at the University of West London. Her research interests include techno-feminism, social reproduction, and theories of work, and she's the author of Xenofeminism and Beyond Explicit, Pornography and the Displacement of Sex. Thank you, Helen, for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. Looking forward to it. And then uh, I introduce to you Maciej Gasiu Gosniowski, who is a graduate of the National Theatre School in Kraków. He directed the show Borderline Queen, Kerstas at the National Theatre in Vilnius, and Patriarchy Queen in cooperation with the Comuna Warszawa Theatre. His work is inspired by the art of trashu and breaks the stereotypical perception of gender, especially masculinity. He describes himself with the phrase, masculine enough to be queer. Um, first of all, we have another guest today, and this is uh, Himera. And maybe Himera, you can just briefly introduce yourself to the audience, uh, who you are, and then we can enter the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you very much for having me. I'm Haimira uh, and drag queen originally coming from Ukraine, uh, but now living in Poland where I've met Konshu and we had a pleasure to do a few of the activism uh, engagements together as well as create a lively and colorful drag scene here in Warsaw, Poland. Perfect. Okay, before we start this conversation, uh, I quickly want to remind the audience of the possibility to engage in the conversation by asking questions. And for everyone who's watching this live, you are welcome to send us your questions by emailing to schoolofresistance at antigent.be or by commenting on the live stream on the Facebook pages of Antigent or IIPM. Okay, um, first of all, um, I would like to start off the conversation with a very actual situation that is happening right now. Um, in Hungary, um, Viktor Orban's nationalist government, which is also allied with Poland's governing law and justice, the Peace Party, has introduced a new law banning the display and promotion of homosexuality among under 18s. And this came into a very prominent situation right now because the city of Munich wanted to light up its sports stadium in rainbow colors on Wednesday as Germany's national team took on Hungary in the European Soccer Championship. Um, it would be a show of support for LGBTQI people, but the UEFA rejected the request by the Munich City Council. And Gashu and Himera, first of all, how did you experience the situation? Um, how how was that for you? Um, and also, how is the law that is now being um, introduced in Hungary is affecting also maybe the situation in Poland? So, like, of course, yeah, it, it, it affects a lot because, like, we are worried that uh, the same rule will happen here. So, yes, we are scared. And, like, few actions actually happened in front of the, um, in front of the embassy. Uh, so yes, like what, what I can say more, we are we, we are really worried that the same rule will will happen here in Poland, but we are still fighting. So let's see. The thing is that being a neighbor to a country who shares a lot of similar ideas that mm -hmm. Polish culture and Polish government uh, entertains as well is just as alarming as uh, being in Poland and not 
like technically affected by Hungarian law, but definitely feeling the pressure of that neighbor that tends to have some support here in Poland as well, at least from the third eye perspective, uh, is definitely worrying. And the goal is to make sure that this thing doesn't happen. Uh, I actually recently spoke to a friend who gave me a bit more information about what actually happened in Hungary. And I was like, well, that would never happen in Poland. He was like, really? Really? Yes, exactly. Are really? you sure? Are you sure? Why not? I'm like, well, really? Why not? Let me like I try to translate. There is one sentence. It's just what if I, I will like speak in Polish English because sometimes I need to just ask a question. It's just proverb. Proverb. There is one like proverb. 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 Uh, I'll try to translate it. Uh, Polish Hungarian one brothers. Well, like when get two brothers. You know what mm -hmm. I mean. Polish Hungarian two brothers. Uh, so and like you can feel it that uh, our government is kind of like proud that it's happened that it's happened there, and I'm really worried that they'll they'll try to copy it here. And it's already uh, been happening on some levels when sex education was uh, being introduced to Polish schools. A lot of uh, people and and uh, and the government itself uh, was very much against it and and. At the end, of prohibited it. Am I right? Yes. So th when you think that Polish being a part of EU, and from my perspective, being Ukrainian, going to a better place that is Poland, trying to have a better life here, and uh, seeing the such things happening does not give much hope uh, because you feel like the whole Western world is following best practices of sex education and the importance of it amongst youngsters while Polish government completely abandons it. So one may just question what direction this may go further being that Hungary did take it a few steps further. Mm. Thank you for, for also um, sharing your, your worry. And um, first, we, we are in Pride Month now. So I want to go maybe also into the more um, hopeful question of how are you celebrating Pride right now in Poland? And um, how, what are your actions right now? And um, how are visible are you? And what is your support maybe also from, from others? There is like, I will say that there is many, many reasons to, to celebrate the Pride. Every single person uh, walking uh, in the march is it, it, a reason to celebrate the Pride. You know what I mean? Every mm -hmm. single queer, every single queer person, is a reason to celebrate the pride. Uh, so yes, we are celebrating as much as we can. We are celebrating. Of course, we had a like big um, equality parade here mm -hmm. here in Warsaw. In actual, it was really big. <laughs> I didn't expect that that it will be that big, but it was it was huge. Specifically during the pandemic. Specifically during during the pandemic. Uh, and now, like in few days, they will be in Poznan. Uh, then in Łódź, I think I'm not sure because I don't know the calendar. But the, the, like, like in few places in Poland, there will be like some marches. Mm -hmm. this, is the, this is the word, yes, marches, equality marches. Uh, so yes, we are celebrating it, and we are trying to talk about it. And very helpful, I will say that very helpful is the uh, is internet because we can celebrate uh, the, the the pride via via internet. Via internet, online, from, online on social medias. Uh, there's many, many, many inter, many, uh, many, many actions going on on uh, around the around the Poland, which can like invite the, all queer people from around the Poland. And um, my question is also how how safe are you feeling um, when you celebrate Pride, and um, what? What measures do you have to take, or what? Um, because uh, I, of of course, I'm also um, I'm Polish from my background, and I also notice, of course, the extreme right wing demonstrations that are happening. And how how are these situations when when you celebrate Pride? How how is this safety wise, and how do you feel? Do you if feel this... safe in Warsaw, going through? Like I will tell you that maybe I'm not as brave as as as, as Hemi Rice. Uh, like 
for example, to go to the Pride, I'm taking a taxi. Mm. Me too. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I'm not sure that I will be brave enough to, to take a bus, for example. Public transportation. Or any public transportation, yes. You know what I mean? And that's just this, this uh, simple... Um, like what? Example. This simple example can show that we are not feeling very comfortable with this situation. You, you know what I mean? Mm. I mean, from a perspective of different countries like Germany or Austria, where I've been to a few parades, everybody's colorful there, everybody's work, walking on streets, and it seems like they are way more confident than us here in Poland, because while there is a Pride Month, we have prides, we have parades, uh, people are out there, they are out there in groups. Uh, it's mm -hmm. even being recommended to be in groups, to avoid being alone, because yes. there simply are a lot of chances of being attacked. Uh, Warsaw, I feel like, is a bubble within the bubble, a country within the country, because uh, here it's a bit different here. Uh, people are more open it's to like it. Island. Yeah, it's like an island that, that, that has its own rules and, and it, it, it lives by its own life. And that's what makes it better. Because, for example, Gonshu mentioned earlier that I, I might be a bit braver uh, than, than him, which I disagree, but my bra bravery very often come uh, in line with stupidity as well <laughs> and, uh, and, and naive uh, thinking that, you know, I mean, I can walk on streets in whatever way I want to and whatever I look like uh, and not worry about anything. But it's also not the thinking that probably everybody share here in Poland uh, because a lot of people would not go out dressed up in heels or mm -hmm. um, wearing lipstick or, or whatever. But I always say one thing, mm -hmm. I may look like a drag queen and I may even look like a woman, but at the end of the day, I'm a man with a heel that can be a very powerful weapon. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I always uh, cheer myself up with that thinking. Nonetheless, <laughs> it's probably a bit irresponsible to be walking outside by yourself in uh, some queer costumes and some queer looks. Mm. And to, so we, we spoke about what is happening in Hungary, we spoke about pride, but, um, what is the current situation for the LGBTQI community in Poland right now? Could you explain to our audience what is it about the LGBTQI free zones? Um, where, what, what is this concept? Where is this going? And um, could you like maybe give us an introduction to what's okay, the situation? So like, uh, because of, uh, the, of, of, of Bartek Staszewski actions that he, uh, he showed uh, this LGBT, LGBTQ, LGBT free zones, this is how, how it's called. Uh, he showed it, uh, he created a sign. It's, it's like wonderful action, seriously. It's wonderful action. You can, you can find it on the internet. And now he's one of the most, uh, the, the most famous activists, I think in Europe, actually. Uh, because of his action, Europe seen that, some, that, that such a thing happened. And uh, this, Small governments, how to say that like, there's some around there? Yeah, city governments, city, city councils. Like city city government governments uh, start to cancel it. You know what I mean? They start they start to say that we didn't happen, that like we didn't uh, we haven't done such a thing. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. where does that uh, idea and law of LGBT free zones come from? Well it's come from where it where, where it starts? Yeah, yeah. where did it happen? I feel like you've no idea how it how it started. Like I cannot I, I cannot tell you the beginning of this action. What I believe is that the overall government. I uh, started from the church, actually. Like seriously, sorry. Mm. I'm not sure, but I, what I believe is that mm. the government introduced uh, the idea of uh, maintaining family values and oh, yeah. to mm. making sure that the family values are maintained throughout the history and throughout. Uh, the overall process of life and uh, uh, what was a part of that idea of maintaining family values was that family consists of a man and a woman and a child that they can conceive which two men cannot do 
where those LGBT free zones come from um, is one thing, but it's also a threat. Uh, yes. It seems like a Polish government trying to very much um, divide the, the society into two sp um, opposite spectrums and the common enemy is supposed to be the LGBT uh, community because it's um, the, the rhetoric is that it's a Western influence that is trying to take over Poland and change uh, the historic values and the Christianity and all of it. So it's a threat. And now having one, one common threat for different groups of society is a very good strategy for politics. It's a very bad strategy for a society, which mm -hmm. seems to be uh, what is happening here. And so when the LGBT, LGBT free zones were introduced, a lot of those small city councils and city governments took over that idea of supporting it uh, in the spirit of supporting family values. And so it wasn't a technical law. Uh, it, it wasn't a technical law. It was the idea, the kind of symbol, kind of symbol that the government chooses to support. Now, Bartek uh, was able to visualize how would it look like if it was in fact a law? What mm -hmm. would it look like? By printing out or actually making a uh, metal templates of LGBT free zones under the names of cities and uh, villages that accepted that idea. Mm. And so he made a huge uh, action of taking pictures of the names of these cities and villages with that LGBT free zone next to it, just to visualize what it would look like if it became in fact a reality. And so uh, the backfire was that the European uh, nations noticed the law, not the law, but the idea and the way that it's going and, and the direction it's following and got very much alarmed, uh, which resulted yes. in withdrawal of some European funds mm -hmm. from some uh, um, city councils and capitals, which was very funny to me to observe that the minute the European funds were withdrawn from these cities and governments. The cities, like Gonsu said, uh, governments reacted saying that, oh no, it we're all happen. in. We're all in for the LGBT. Yes. We support, <laughs> we love, we, we <laughs> love LGBT. Get us some LGBT in here. <laughs> so the reason is that the minute you lose money, you become a supporter of whatever brings the money back, uh, which mm -hmm. did not happen. To my knowledge, uh, the European government uh, European nations did not uh, continue to invest into these small cities. What did happen, though, is that the Polish government um, started to, start to support this, uh, the, the cities which, will, which, were, which used this symbol, the, which used this uh, LGBT uh, free zones. They compensated mm -hmm. for the withdrawal of funds of the UN uh, in EU nations by um, bringing funds from the uh, mm -hmm. country's capital uh, mm -hmm. and actually doubling it in some cases, even tripling but, but it in, in some but cases. In just few. So it was, it was uh, very sad to see that um, people have some of their values, uh, even though they are wrong, they just are about as easy to change their values as they are able to change their um, money source <laughs> because like i am um, i just like said that it's, it's it's happened because of the church i mean um uh, i will say that in poland we have like our own catholic church than in like for example than, than in vatican you know what i mean we are totally different even if we if the, the catholic the polish catholic church belongs to vatican they are really like totally different in, in different way of thinking and for example in church they are saying the and it, it happened two, two years ago actually the, the whole action happened two years ago uh and two years ago Arcibiskup in, in Drashevsky, how to say Arcibiskup? Archbishop. Archbishop uh, said in the one of the biggest church uh, churches in Poland he said that we are facing the rainbow Zaraza? disease Plague. the rainbow disease Plague. he called that as a rainbow disease and that that, that 
uh, that Polish uh, society have to fight against the rainbow disease. It happened two years ago. And like from that point, I think from that point, more or less, this LGBT zones um, started to happen. Like, okay. I'm, uh, I, I will not say that it happened because of that, but it was like in the same time, you know what I mean? So I, the Catholic, Poly, Polish Catholic church really influenced and, uh, and support such an action as LGBT free zones. It's Hello, interesting yeah. to see the way that sort of values have been mobilized. Sorry, like, can you can you say it a bit louder? I, I'm not sure I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's really interesting the way that the uh, whole idea of sort of values and ideology has been mobilized in these discussions. So, I mean, because I guess there's been this sort of effort to frame it not as targeting specific LGBT people, but sort of trying to, to combat the rainbow plague, trying to combat yes. LGBTQ ideology. And it's yes. really interesting kind of like mirrors there with the way things like critical race theory are being treated in the, in the US, where the idea is what you're mobilizing against is a threatening ideology. The people are fine. It's the ideas which are somehow the, the cancer, the plague that we have to mm. counter. And also the way that all of this, and I, you guys have able, you picked this up really clearly, is rooted through the figure of the child. The child who has to be protected at all costs from adult queerness. And the, that framing so neglects the fact that queer children exist. You know, they are absolutely erased as, as a possibility. And what you have is this sort of um, metaphysically inflated phantom of the child with a capital C who represents the future, defined not in the sense of something that's emergent or to come or, or potentially different or mutational in some way, but a future that represents the exact replication of the same mm. across time. So more of the same, the child is the figure of the more of the same. And you know, when you deal with children in the abstract with a capital C, ignore the fact that queer children exist, ignore the fact that children are actually a very differentiated mass of individuals, and start seeing them as this kind of uh, sort of holy figure that cannot be contested. And every appeal that's made in the name of the child can't be resisted. You know, this idea that you cannot say like, well, we're doing this for the children and therefore you get that, that it's impossible to argue against that kind of logic. Um, you know, I think, I just think it's really interesting that it's, it is the way that ideas of values and ideas of ideologies become these kind of Trojan horses to smuggle in actually the ongoing stigmatization of people. Thank you. And it's very sad as well. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. So um, thank you, first of all, for giving us like a little um, introduction into the situation. And um, so what, what the School of Resistance always tries is to say, okay, what could be actually potentials or future um, or possibilities. And um, that's why I really, um, we invited Helen because Helen comes from a background where, where she, she created with a group of others a proposal for um, some sort of futurity or potentiality. And um, Helen, um, I, I have some quotes from um, your work and I will just state them for the audience and then you could maybe just really explain to us your concept. Um, can you can try. <laughs> Xenofeminism is gender abolitionist. Let a hundred sexes bloom. So Helen, what is xenofeminism about? So what's the word actually? What's, what's coming? Where is it coming from? Um, how did you develop maybe also this theory and how can we situate this theory into the context of queer liberation, also into the historic struggles maybe that have been happening in the last decades? Mm. So to, to sort of address the name, so uh, the Zeno comes from this idea of the, the outsider or the stranger, as opposed to kind of the, the familiar or the figure of the compatriots. So, it's kind of, I guess it kind of relates to, you know, the discussion that we were just engaging in, that it's about, it's about a feminism that engages with the alien to some extent. So the idea of a, for example, a future that's not based on the unthinking repetition of the same, but creates a space for the emergence of 
genuine alternatives, alternatives that we may not yet be able to foresee. Um, and then, so the so the way I I define xenofeminism is I use a sort of tripartite kind of structure to to talk about it. And so, first of all, I think of it as a techno materialist form of feminism. So. Xenofeminism is really interested in technologies as activist tools. It thinks about, you know, I mean, we had this conversation about what the internet enables us to do that perhaps would have been impossible before. Um, so we, we kind of start from this idea that, well, what, what can technologies do? But we're very keen that we don't kind of snip technologies out of their contexts. So if we're talking about technologies, we don't want to treat them as if they're sort of like this a ethereal disembodied cloud that just sort of exists without um, without anything surrounding them. We think very much about their brute materiality. So um, that's in terms of the, the, the infrastructures that ground them, but also in terms of the bodies of the people who use technologies and who produce technologies. So trying to get this very um, grounded sense of how technologies work in context and thinking about it that way. So that's the first thing, the techno-material aspect. Uh, the second term I use to describe it is anti-naturalist. So now that's, this is an idea that uh, sort of triggers some resistance because people think when I'm talking about anti-naturalism, I'm talking about being against nature in some way. Um, and that's not really what, what we're kind of getting at. Xenofeminism is an anti-naturalist endeavor in the sense that it frames nature and the natural as a space for contestation. So we don't think that, that nature is some sort of um, untouchable realm, but actually we understand that it's always developed in conversation with culture, including technology, and also that it is within the purview of politics. Nature is always already political, so it's not outside of that framework. And xenofeminism kind of assumes that any political project that's based upon nature as some kind of pseudo theological limit or some kind of uh, cartography of the untouchable um, is going to lend huge conceptual resources to the conservative punishment of radical difference. So um, when it says, oh, well, it's just things are just this way because they're natural, it's naturally that way, you know, uh, there's particularly ideas around around gender and sexuality to suggest that things are unnatural or natural as a way of kind of closing down a conversation xenofeminism seeks to resist that. So um, to just use, I've got a little quote from the manifesto here, which I think is um, relevant. So we, we write that nothing should be accepted as fixed, permanent or given, neither material conditions nor social forms. Anyone who's been deemed unnatural in the face of reigning biological norms, anyone who's experienced injustices wrought in the name of natural order, will realize that the glorification of nature has nothing to offer us. The queer and trans among us, the disabled, as well as those who have suffered discrimination due to pregnancy or duties connected to child rearing. So we sort of start from this idea that it doesn't help intellectually or morally or politically to appeal to the natural, you know. And so that, that is sort of um, but this idea of, for example, saying that we are, we are born this way. We think that that has a very particular set of strategic affordances, uh, but also that it needs to be complemented with a kind of a different approach that doesn't try to kind of um, start to inevitabilize uh, gender or sexuality, but actually sees it as a space of transformation. So um, I think, so, so just to kind of clarify, when we say that we're anti-naturalist, we're not trying to say that there is no, that we're against nature. We're not trying to say that the biological doesn't have any capacity to kind of structure our world or um, shape the possibility space of, of what we can do as political subjects. And so we we're not trying to deny that there is some kind of biological stratum to embodied reality or to suggest that you know, different bodies don't have different susceptibilities or capacities. Of course, they do. What we are trying to challenge is the idea that the biological is immutable or fixed simply because it is biological, you know, so that's on the one hand that involves acknowledging that social ideas 
um, are that sort of shape how we understand embodiment. You know, the, you know, we have to acknowledge that many of our ideas about gender and sex and sexuality are ideological ideas. But the, the sort of the more radical kernel involves framing the terrain of biology as rightfully subject to change. So um, we sort of suggest that you know, uh, biology is not destiny because biology itself can be made subject to change. It can be technologically transformed and it should be technologically transformed in the pursuit of reproductive justice and the progressive transformation of gender. That's kind of the anti-naturalist thing. And then that brings us on to the, the quote that you started with, which was about uh, gender abolitionism. Um, so that's the, the third component that I use when I'm trying to offer a definition of xenofeminism. Uh, it's basically to stress the idea that xenofeminism would like to kind of agitate for the uh, deconstruction of a binary gender system. Um, and this is really connected to this idea of anti-naturalism, I think. So if we understand that uh, nature is folded into the domain of politics, then that which we currently think of as gender is one domain of potential emancipatory transformation. And um, so I guess one thing that, that I would really stress when we're, when we're talking about this idea of gender abolitionism is that it's not about the stripping away of gender markers. It's not about the imposition of some kind of uh, uniform, everybody looks the same, everybody is the same, there is no gender, there is no difference, there is no diversity. Um, it's sort of, it's more about understanding the, the body's position as a reworkable platform. And kind of, I guess, instead of arguing for some kind of gender austerity, arguing instead for something like a gender post scarcity. So the idea that gender might proliferate to the extent that it overruns a binary gender system would kind of be um, what, are, what, what we're getting at really. So yeah, so yeah, this idea that rather than there being, so we understand the, the fundamental paucity of the model that says you have masculine, male, feminine, female, and all gender gets funneled into that paradigm. And it's sort of, uh, we argue for this sort of um, proliferation of gender outside of that. So we want the restrictions upon gendered identity to be scrapped and this kind of tenacious binary thinking to be disregarded. And instead, we're really interested in the idea of a multiply gendered world. So if xenofeminism is gender abolitionist, it's in the sense that it rejects the validity of any social order that's anchored in identities as a basis of oppression, and in the sense that we embrace sexual diversity beyond any binary. So this is where the idea of let a hundred sexes bloom comes from. You know, and I think what one thing that I would add to that is this idea of proliferation. It's not just a, 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 that's not an end point. So this idea that we could maybe have numerous self categorizing options, you know, hundreds and hundreds of drop down menu items that we could choose as we get into these more and more specific kind of gender categories for ourselves. I think there is a certain kind of pleasure associated with that a certain there are a manifold pleasures of gender as well as uh, pains and sufferings that are attached to it. But the recognition of the possibility of innumerable genders should only be a first step in the refusal to accept any gender as a basis of stable signification. So um, we think that at the moment under current systems of binary gender, gender has this, is seen as having this massive explanatory power for why people are the way that they are. You know, that the, the if you designate somebody a particular gender, that somehow gives you an insight into uh, their aptitudes, their capacities, their interests, their life course, their consumer behaviours. Gender becomes a, a shorthand for a, a mass of different kind of uh, bodily processes, identity traits, all of this stuff gets scooped up in these big categories of gender. And we just think that that doesn't work, that we should be looking for more nimble and inclusive vectors of solidarity, and that we should be thinking not in terms of these 
big identities as explaining who we are. We shouldn't think about gender as bearing the weight of signifying something beyond itself, but should instead just see gender as just gender. <laughs> gender is, is just, you know, that they, they don't have this power to explain anything about who we are. That the categories that we adopt aren't a sort of shorthand for identity as a whole, but just refer simply to gender in and of itself. I hope that makes some kind of sense. Thank I'm you. Not sure I, did, but I, hope, I hope it did to some extent. <laughs> It does, Helen, and I think oh, you, you triggered really a lot of uh, interesting factors uh, from all of these different things. Um, <clears throat> obviously, we were a bit behind with English, so all the hard words was hard to comprehend, but the overall mm -hmm. idea is definitely understandable. And it's funny what you were finishing with when it comes to the idea of gender needed, needing to be binary in order for it to open up. Because that's something that I've uh, had discussion with with my another drag queen friend, Foya Stara, who I've asked to explain to myself uh, what, how, how do non-binary people identify as? And obviously there's a huge spectrum there, right? And um, in drag, there's always this play and game on bending gender. And for order for that game and that fun and that joke to happen, you need a construct of gender. You need to have exactly. it to be binary in order to then be able to bend it. So I feel like it very nicely overlaps with, uh, with, with you, what you were explaining about this concept in general. But I also do have a follow-up question here when it comes to that unnaturalism uh, or anti-naturalism um, that you were talking about. Because in, in the context of, for example, gay people, the the idea and the belief is that it's it's natural to us. We were born gay, thus it's natural, thus it's our biology. How does um, xenofeminism uh, react to that? Yeah, I mean, I think the first important point to make is that there is obviously no one way of being queer. There is a, a huge, a huge different range. And there's actually a, a really rich interesting kind of uh, body of queer texts around ideas of gender abolitionism as well. So whilst I think that it is this, this idea of it being something natural is something that's very much mobilized within a lot of uh, contemporary LGBT activism, there's also a whole other activist tradition and a whole other philosophical tradition that takes a slightly different approach as well. So I think, so where xenofeminism has an issue is when nature isn't seen as a, a platform it's not seen as something changeable or something to do something with but is seen as being both a stable origin and an incontestable end point so that's where there's kind of this slight schism between some frameworks of queer activism and a more xenofeminist framework of queer activism so when we talk about positions which are founded on a claim of being born this way which is obviously, you know, quite a, a, a popular slogan. What we have is these sort of supposedly inbuilt characteristics that become sort of set up or framed as being a, um, a transcendental guarantee. You know, it's the idea of, there's a quote in the Xenofeminist Manifesto about how we're told to seek solace in unfreedom as if offering an excuse with nature's blessing. Now, certainly... Some politics of, for example, trans liberation have staked their claims on a kind of redemptive understanding of identity. And, you know, and I think this idea that there is some internal truth to gender, some internal truth to sexuality that can be um, sought out or uh, divined in some way, it's a really understandable approach given the perpetually embattled condition of queer and trans communities. Because what it does, and I think I've kind of gestured to this already, is that it, what it does is it inevitabilizes one's own existence. It's like, well, of, yeah, of, of course I'm gay, of course I'm queer, of course I'm trans, I can't change it, it's just the way that it is. And that makes it, it makes it seem inevitable. And when you're sort of working for your basic survival, strategically, that makes a massive amount of sense. So I think, you have to kind of recognize the way that this, these strategies are born this way 
engage with sort of ideas on the ground. But I think they, there's also, I think those strategies have to be complemented, not necessarily replaced, not ousted, because they do have massive utility, but actually complemented with approaches that actually deal with some of those really radical and emancipatory tendencies of trans feminism, which relate to its capacity to act as a sort of assertion of freedom in the face of an order that seemed immutable. Like saying that, okay, well, there's this whole realm of identity, a whole realm of being human that's been set up culturally and historically as an untouchable, you know, if something is natural, you cannot, you cannot touch it. That's the end of the conversation. And a whole huge amount of what I find to be the most energizing and inspiring trans feminist uh, practice and thinking has gone, has been about refusing that, actually claiming freedom from a space that we're not supposed to be able to um, enter into, that's not supposed to be a space of human intervention. And I, I, I find that sort of a massively uh, exciting uh, trait. Now, I think what I would say as well is that I don't in any way want to suggest that, that trans subjects, for example, are at fault for reinforcing a, a gender binary um, or to deny lived experiences of many of our trans siblings. Um, but rather, I want to sort of acknowledge that these experiences of gender are already determined through the terms of power. And I think, so xenofeminism is kind of, it's, it's curious because it has this gender abolitionist, anti-naturalist stance that goes alongside what I hope is a rather more pragmatic focus on sort of agitating for the broadening of access to legal and medical and social technologies of transition for everybody who wants them. So, you know, that there's this real focus on, you know, making life livable for queer people on the ground. But that is then combined with this sort of I guess sort of longer term thinking about the overthrowal of these existing systems and I guess what so it's more about having this queer anti-naturalist gender abolitionism sit alongside certain species of strategic naturalism mm. and having instead this sort of ecology of activism like a multi-pronged attempt where all of these different uh, perspectives and time scales and agendas kind of inter interact. And so trying to find a way where we can maximize the pleasures of gender whilst minimizing the pains and the harms to some extent. Thank you, Helen. Um, so you, we, you already jumped into, it was very interesting for me to hear uh, Gashu and Himera and uh, responding to Helen's approach of xenofeminism, saying that there's some like affinity also in the way drag culture performs. And so um, I would really like to enter into the, because we are an artistic format, into the question of art and um, art also as a political tool. So I first have a, a little quote also um, from Helen. Um, which says that despite its name, gender abolitionism that we talked about now briefly is not a destructive project, but a creative one. It's a call for a world in which there are lots of different ways of doing gender. And now I'm wondering, Maciej and uh, Gashu and Himera, how do you feel about this question of like the creativity of destruction of gender? And how is this uh, part of your work on as a political activist, but also as an artist? So could you yeah, help That's us really get good. into the theory <laughs> of uh, dra drag culture also? I think it would be the best person to answer that. Seriously? <laughs> why? Okay, no, I'm curious why. Because <laughs> um, Mache, I'm also, um, I am maybe to um, say this in your bi biography, you, you end with the statement, masculine enough to be queer. So yeah, what, what is this about? And maybe you could like okay, so show us. <laughs> okay, so maybe I will example what I'm focused on uh, when I'm doing drag. So actually I'm focused on uh, what does it mean to be a masculine? Because actually I have no idea and I'm so happy that I have no idea what does it mean to be masculine. Uh, 
but there is some kind of like stereotypical um, pictures which which uh, male uh, society male part of the society are focused on but actually they are so different and there there's no uh, there's no such a like there's no one thing which which you can call this is this is like masculinity and this is what i'm playing with that i'm in my drug i'm still trying to be like i'm playing with this being masculine for example like now i'm wearing shirt but as well i'm, I'm wearing makeup you know what i mean this is what, like what this is what i'm what, what i'm doing in drug uh but like in whole situation, I will say that the drug culture is a perfect example of uh, what Helen was saying. Because, like, of course, we are working with, but but Jaimera said it said it already that we somehow we are working with uh, this binary um, what yeah. you, with this binary idea. But we are just using it using it as a tool. You know what I mean? We are using it as, as a tool to say that like, such a thing actually does not exist. Mm -hmm. There but, is just pictures. You can inspire. You can be inspired by this, by this idea, by these ideas. But actually, it's not exist. And this is what what is, what drug is about, from my point of view. I definitely agree with you here. Like I mentioned before, <clears throat> drag kind of falls in between those two binary states. And it's very beautiful to see how each one of those artists and drag performers interpret it on their own way. Uh, that's why drag really uh, made me do it because there's such a variety there. There's such a uh, diversity there that you see someone being extra feminine, someone being extra masculine, someone being nothing in between, someone, be, someone being from the, the, the space and the moon and, and an alien. And it's beautiful to see how all of that opens up on the basis of only these two ideas of masculine and feminine. And the interpretation of all of this from different perspective is really what uh, inspires me to do drag. Exactly, because like even more, I would say that not only that, that 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 not masculine and feminine are the limits; they are even more. You know what I mean? Something 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 behind the masculinity and the be uh, behind the the feminine the femininity. Yes, this is the word. Okay, <laughs> sorry, like my English. Uh, you know what I mean? Like drag is less horizontal. It's, I don't know how even maybe. circular. Yes. Mm. I mean, I think, you know, this really taps into some of what's behind a sort of the, the, the idea of abolishing a binary gender system through the proliferation of genders, right? Because, uh, Gashi, the kind of point that you make is that there are so many different images of, for example, masculinity, and many of them are not compatible, you know? Mm -hmm. So actually, there is, there is no pure pole of masculinity no, no, no. that could be accessible. Because there are so many different forms of masculinity that that you can't you cannot be perfectly masculine because it is already too multiple to ever embody that position and i think it's also really important to acknowledge that the experiences of gender are always shaped by intersectional factors so actually the possibility of embodying ideas of masculine and feminine masculinity and femininity are already shaped by things like race you know you see that there have been certain ideas of for example white femininity as uh, fragility, delicacy, the need to be protected from work that very much have not applied to women of colour who have been seen to not embody that kind of femininity, who have, you know, there have been some sort of uh, post-colonial, decolonial scholars who've sort of talked about the fact that it's, it, it's impossible to be both black and a woman because the category of woman has already been shaped by this idea of whiteness. It's fundamentally a white category. So there's already this mass proliferation of gender in ways that are, you know, occupiable or non-occupiable by different people in different times and places and situations. So gender is already multiple. It's already overrunning its categories. And, you know, I think a part of part of the sort of the gender abolitionist element is understanding how that might be leveraged in a more emancipatory way to facilitate uh, gendered freedom and uh, maximize our ability to exercise both individual and collective autonomy within the space of gender. So, um, um, Helen, oh, yeah, please go on. No, I'll just yes, like, there, there's like, just as an inspiration, for example, like for me, uh, 
bodybuilders show. You know the bodybuilders, right? Like, yeah. c- come on, they behave exactly like drag queens. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of makeup, the poses, everything. They behave like drag queens. Come on, they're perfect in that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they would fall into that stereotypical idea of masculinity, <laughs> right? <laughs> up to up to a point but again it's there there are these contrasting there are these contrasting norms where the very fact of bodily display would seem to destabilize this idea that they are hypermasculine so certainly the musculature uh, is is hypermasculine but there's a sense in which that attentiveness to self-crafting actually already problematizes this idea of being able to occupy a masculine norm and you know you and then when you bring in the fact that there are that there are cis female bodybuilders, you know, they are also in this very, they are in, to some extent engaged in a hyper feminine display because of the presentation of the body, partially clothed, heavily made up as you identify on a stage, you know, it's very much enmeshed within a certain set of feminine, feminized gender norms. But then the, the nature of the bodily display, what they are being kind of critically assessed on in this process of sort of, um, the the judging and the categorizing of the body is so completely completely different from what we associate with feminine norms so is there's already all of this there's there's already like mass gender confusion <laughs> and what xenofeminism would like is to just continue the gendered chaos like build on it build on it build on it make it so that actually gender overruns its categories to the point where we can no longer rely on it as a framework of signification you know, we can no longer assume that we know anything about anybody on the basis of the gender that we assign them, like, because it's all it is, is just it's itself. It has no explanatory or significatory power beyond just being a gender. And I feel like people choose to ignore that simply because they like to rely on what they know, right? And what they know is that there is a female and a male, and that's it. And then when there comes a lot of the unknown, that's the primarily fear of everybody's out there you are afraid of what you don't know and when you don't know such things or you choose to ignore them you choose to stick to what you know and it's really funny how you mentioned that that it's already happening but people choose not to see that yeah but i mean there's there are very good reasons why we rely on stereotypes socially you know because Mm -hmm. actually we we engage with people in all kinds of anonymized situations where it's actually really helpful to be able to just think, okay, I can just refer to a sort of mental cheat sheet for what kind of individual I'm engaging with. And uh, I guess it's just the fact that I'm very invested in sort of uh, gendered anarchy and the proliferation of trouble that like (laughs) I, I I would rather make it impossible to rely on any kind of shorthand and actually have us, I don't know, there's something really, there's something hopelessly romantic and I'm sure very philosophically problematic about the idea that we could confront each other as individuals in a (laughs) in the world but uh but uh, there's 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 something there that I find kind of quite appealing as an idea so what I'm taking out of this uh conversation is really create more trouble more gender chaos (laughs) proliferate it all and so I have just some um Last questions, um, which I find what would give me like a, also me personally as an artist, um, like um, Helen, this whole idea, it's, it's, as you say, it's highly creative and it's doing and undoing gender. It's, it's an artistic practice. And for you, um, where do you see the potential of art? as we are also um, being part of an art festival right now in uh, queer and feminist liberation. And the same question then goes to um, Gashu and Himera. So your, um, the way you use your art as a drag performer, um, how can this be? Is this a political tool? If yes, and how? And um, I would really like to, to, to hear your, your, your opinion about that as our last questions of this very beautiful conversation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think I am very interested in a sort of um, exploded or expanded understanding of art uh, as, you know, it, it precisely at this level of sort of the autonomous process of shaping environments and identities 
you know, kind of thinking beyond the creation of, of specific works. Although I think the creation of specific works is, you know, is, is part of this. And actually art has a really interesting role in sort of giving us a sort of facilitating ways of thinking otherwise. You know, because when I, when I try and articulate these ideas, I am very constrained by what is my medium for communicating them, which is uh, language that starts and flows and then ends. So there's this very temporal dimension to what I do. And I try my best to develop concepts, to apply concepts. And, and so I'm working in a very particular register. And it's a register where ambiguity it's actually something that's discouraged. But what you're striving for all the time is clarity. And so you, there's not quite so much space to maybe sit with something in, without coming down in a particular position on it. You know, I, I'm, as, as, a, as a philosopher or as a theorist or as an activist, I'm expected to be thinking about, well, what's, what is the positive content here? What do I, what do I believe? What is my argument? You know, what is my cause? And what are my tactics? So this very sort of concrete space of thinking through these things where there's actually less space for discomfort and less space for not knowing. And if you want to sit in the space of ambiguity, you really have to actively claim it against disciplinary traditions. You know, you have to claim it against a set of norms that's steering you to act or talk in a very particular way. So, um, I mean, I think art has greater capacity to, um, to think about things in a way that is less prescriptive, potentially, because there is, I mean, every text, no matter what its intentions, is polysemic. It will always be picked up and read and reread and reinterpreted and meanings that you had intended will be missed and meanings that you never intended will be added or created. That's just the nature of, of communication that happens everywhere. But I think, I think in art, there is the space to be more overtly polysemic, to let multiple meanings sort of jostle against each other and not have to um, attempt to introduce a framework of resolution where you're like, I'm building a case, here is the conclusion. Actually, things can sit together um, and just sort of, you know, jostle up against each other in comfortable and uncomfortable ways. And that can be a real tool for stimulating thinking. And I think for one of the things that we say in the Xenofeminist Manifesto is that we want Xenofeminism to be a platform, not a blueprint. So it's not about trying to prescribe a way of doing things, but trying to create something that could be a tool for different people to think with. Um, I think that's something that, that we really aspire to. And I think there you have this very interesting recursive relationship between uh, art and philosophy where, you, you know, where you can attempt to be a tool for somebody to think with and they can produce a work which actually then shapes the way you then return to it. And what we use as raw materials for our thinking, you know, we're constantly engaged in this process of exchange, which I think can be quite exhilarating and rewarding. Uh, so... I mean, we've been really, really fortunate that actually a lot of artists who I massively um, respect and I just really actually just enjoy their work have taken up xenofeminism as, as part of their sort of conceptual toolkit for, for thinking and doing things. And, you know, well, I think I will be a very happy person if I manage to continue to produce stuff that people can think alongside and with. And that's not just about accepting something or saying like, oh, yeah, I'm going to take this idea and use it in a literal way. Very often it's about how people refuse your ideas, how people reject them, how people argue against them. Because actually what you're, in, you're doing is you're engaging in this sort of uh, dialogue, this sort of dialectical process of, of, of transformation. You know, there's really no greater compliment than somebody taking your work as something to argue against or to push against in the course of developing their own their own thinking because it really in that process of refusal and critique they put you at the center of what they're doing so you've really made a contribution and i think that's something that's quite uh, quite exciting to witness thank you helen and gashu and himera so for you the artistic 
maybe also the artistic political potential also of the work you're doing. Like, are, are we mute or not? Okay, <laughs> because we are muting ourselves to to to, to when Helen is talking. Uh, that's 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 why I was uh, checking it. Uh, so, drug is always political because because the we already said it. I think that the gender is the easiest tool to catch by the government and to control it. You know what I mean? For the for, for the government is the easiest way to control to control the society is to give the gender rules and actually when you are doing drug you are saying like fuck it <laughs> you are not going to control me by by my gender so um drug is always political uh and it's uh, it's it doesn't matter how you are presenting your drug how you are performing on drug if you are doing drug you are kind of like against the the system, a, the system. all queer culture actually is about that uh, Karol Radziszewski, very very famous uh, Polish artist, said such a, such a thing that queer culture is always uh, like rebel. Uh, so yes, because you are doing drag, you are you are doing like politi political uh, politi political art. And actually, like our because very often me and Haimira, we are uh, we are in the, in some political actions. We are doing it. I will say no. I don't want to say like even more because of like kind of like push, ooh, even more. It's not about that. But maybe uh, more in the activist yes. uh, theme, uh, fashion, and mm -hmm. then it goes beyond just the existence. Because mm -hmm. like Gonsha said, just by doing drag, by just being drag, you are being political because you're challenging the norms. You, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're disregarding them. And uh, what we do sometimes is often more focus on those activists' action uh, to the culture, to the community, uh, to the society. <clears throat> and I feel like uh, drag gives you a nice medium to make people question things. And that's where the conversation begins, even if it's silent, uh, mm -hmm. simply by looking at you, simply by judging you, simply by criticizing you, mm -hmm. you becoming the center of their attention and some way or the other, you made that conversation happen and that is political because the performer piece of it the performance piece of it always boils down to at least in my opinion to make people question things uh and and be impressed by something be the positive or negative impression whatever mm -hmm. they are left with it's something for them to riddle and to to question and maybe answer maybe not uh i like with my drag performances to make a joke because I'm one of these drag queens who don't shave legs. And so when you look at the construct uh, of, uh, of my face that has been painted to a hyper feminine style and overly glamorous woman, uh, and then you kind of continue moving down there and you see those manly hairy legs, it kind of contradicts one another and you're like, what? Why? <laughs> How? And so this is very often. If I hear, like hear the question, why you didn't shave your your legs? Because I don't I don't have to. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> and it's again challenging the norms, challenging the ideas. Even those of women um, must musting, having to shave legs. Uh, so obviously, uh, I feel like drag is political. Drag gives you voice. You, in general, become more loud when you put on all the makeup and the wig. Like, there's no way you and can come on heels. And... They're like that. <laughs> so I have another people. You cannot avoid people <laughs> looking at you. You cannot avoid people coming to you, and you cannot avoid using your voice. And I feel like that's a very beautiful of drag that gives you the platform to be visible, to be loud, and to speak your truth. Maybe that's why mostly we are doing lip sync because we are screaming all the time and then we are like lip syncing the song, you know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you. Our time is now. It's been a beautiful conversation. I would still give the space to Helen and Gashu and Himera to like say the last words or thoughts. Um, if you have them <laughs> to each other, we can of course meet in the in the room after the life is over to say really properly goodbye, but maybe something that the audience still would like to hear from you. <laughs> the audience to hear from us, I will say, please don't do drug, I need a job. 
<laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Of course, try to do, try to be drunk. I mean, just try it, and you will see that it's really funny. <laughs> I yeah, would I say. No, ahead, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> what I would say is just uh, don't give up. Whatever you do, whatever you believe in, whatever you try to challenge, whatever you uh, feel not accepted about, or whatever you disagree it with, just try it. Keep pushing. Do it. I think I would stress the absolute necessity of solidarity at the current moments where we face a resurgent right. And I think there is a tendency, particularly within Anglophone femin or some parts of Anglophone feminist discourse at the moment, particularly British discourse, what to pit the struggles of cis women against those of trans people, to pit the struggles of uh, lesbian and gay people against those of bisexual people and transsexual people. Um, I really think that we can see from our activist histories that whilst we need to have spaces for autonomous organizing and autonomous thinking and that there will be cases when our priorities are not always exactly the same actually there are many many more situations in which our struggles are one in which our struggle for bodily autonomy and the right to maximize the possibility of self-determination within current social and cultural traditions uh, um, are, are, are shared. You know, that actually we, this, is, this is a moment where, you know, the, we're seeing that in Poland, for example, it's not simply an attack on LGBT people. It's also an attack, uh, an attack on the protections from against domestic violence. It's an attack on, um, protections, uh, uh, the rights to access abortion, even in the most heinous circumstances. All of this is part of a united uh, kind of uh, effort, populist effort to suppress the capacity for self-determination for, for the kind of a, a mass subject. And I think, you know, we need to understand that our struggles are one and we need to be in absolute solidarity with each other. And and moving together. And I think in many ways, the most sort of contemporary, there are a lot of contemporary struggles that are really doing this. I mean, I think we've seen a lot of it in the sort of transversal organizing that's happened in Latin America. And I think in many ways, we've seen it in the Polish context too, where there has been a, a stitching together, a, a, a sewing together into a single garment of all of these struggles around bodily self-determination. And I think we need to sustain that we need to deepen and strengthen our transnational networks of activism and move together to tell a resurgent right that they can frankly fuck off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think this was an awesome um, ending. Um, I would say thank you to the audience. Thank you to our guests. This was um, after uh, 15 episodes and uh, the Corona crisis and the lockdown, the last online um, debate format of School of Resistance. After the summer, we are developing new formats with hopefully open um, analog uh, theaters. Mira, you here will be. We will. We will have an invitation to go there. Yes. So uh, <laughs> we will, of course, uh, try to invite all our School of Resistance guests somehow to stay in our network, as uh, Helen said, to that the School of Resistance becomes a tool against, um, of course, our enemies. And um, I now wish the audience a very beautiful night and um, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye.